Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. Pat. Brindle, how are you? I am. Long time no see. How are you? Was that was, that was a bit funny, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Long time no see. I know. So it might have been, must have been a night. No, two nights. Oh, yeah, eight night. Yeah, yeah. Had yeah, you yeah. over for dinner. Got some nice tie from down the road. Yep. So we're now having dinner together socially. We wear the same shoes. Oh, right, what's going on? Beards are happening. We're the same person. No, be my beard's gone. I should have kept it for for our guest actually. But yeah, that's that's the, he's a special beard. Yeah, very special. Do, you want do we mention? do we want to kind of wax lyrical for a bit or just go straight to the guest? No, let's talk about Tarbell ourselves. <laughs> all right, <laughs> let's introduce. Uh, all right, hey my boo, how you going, man? <laughs> you want me? Hey want me boys, we Pumped got Daz. Pumped to be back. Pumped to be back. Hey, that- um, what are we talking about today, though? Uh, uh, State of Origin <laughs> last night, maybe. Well, let's but no, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about stuff. You know, no, we will quickly because of what I've noticed with New South Wales is that they're really, they're a great team when they've already lost. We're talking rugby league NRL <laughs> for NMD who doesn't care. <laughs> it was just everything. It was a good Everyone game. Everyone cares. But yeah, fucking what's the point? Congratulations. It was a great, it was a great two, first two games. Last night was a bit shit. Nah, it was good. That was a good game. That was a good game. You guys played well. It's well the third deserved. one's always pretty, pretty um open. They've, like yeah. both team, both teams play in the third one because I don't know they're just trying to win. So just and this More is going to be boring, uh, bore a lot of people, I suppose. But what do you think of Tedesco? I think he's he's done. <laughs> nah, I reckon he's solid, man. He's a great fullback. He's slippery. He's a slippery little. You know, he's just having. He's not in. He hasn't been in good form, but I think he's still the best fullback in the game. Really? Yep. Oh wow! All right. What do you think, Hats? Um, I only watch Origin. I don't really watch any like league games all right i just watch origin just to see two it, sets of gym monkeys running <laughs> full pelt at each other to see who hurts the most yeah it's what, fun what, what's your sport hats like if you were to what is uh, this what is fo- the sport? football as in uh, don't, golf if i had to pick one i pick golf but golf. um but foot, football soccer it's just a spectator sport though oh it's great to play it's good Can't to play and it. it's it's nah well it's not maybe not the best on telly what golf no i love what oh, are you talking about. golf you're talking football yeah, golf. Oh, both. They're both shit <laughs> spectator sports. <laughs> nah, golf's good, man. You can settle in for the day. Yeah, golf's good. It, golf's like um, test cricket, I think. It's just kind of relaxing, it is. relaxing to watch. You don't have to you can come and go and all that kind of stuff. Whereas live, live golf is like big bash. Oh, I haven't <laughs> seen any live golf. I've watched the live golf. I don't mind it. What, are the rules different? No, it's kind of the same, but they play like they play shotgun start. So this is high, everyone. What is um, live golf? What is live golf? So that's that thing with Norman and the Saudis. The Saudi and, thing. Oh yeah, okay. Well, no, well, they great. mixed up. Have they mixed up golf? Have they changed golf? How could? How, what? Okay, talk me through it. Why so it normal golf, you play four rounds, eighteen holes, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and on the after two rounds, there's a cut, and the, you lose the worst players and you keep the best players and you go till Sunday. Keep going, yeah. Right. On, but live golf, it's like um, fifty-four holes, so three rounds. Is that? I think that's right. Um, and they're they're. Playing indiv- individually, but they're also in teams. 52. So 52. No, three eighteens, man. Is it? Yeah, I'll do the numbers. They... <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you do the letters, I'll do the numbers. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I don't think there's a cut. I've only watched a few times, but um, I don't think there's a cut. They're also played in teams. Um, and uh, yeah, they're all guaranteed a fortune. Yeah. And then you have the beer holes where like people are just chucking beers and it is weird. It's, it's, it's like, as I say, it's like the big bash of, Test cricket, that's good cool. in golf. Like it's the, different. Like trying to make it more exciting, like well, like cricket day cricket. Golf's gone a bit. It's gone a bit stale in a sense that everybody cares about the four majors. In fact, they really only care about probably three of the majors. Yeah, and then the rest of the season, unless you're an absolute anorak, you're not really watching. Mm. I would, I would say, I think that's the majority of people. Mm. So the so lives come along and sort of changed around a bit, and then the PGA has gone. Uh, anyway, the virtue signal is in golf have come out. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, and anyway. change our precious tradition. Yeah, but there's all these guys that are saying, "Oh, we wouldn't possibly play for the Saudis," and then in the PGA, there's <laughs> like they 54 up, different sponsors. Didn't they end that up are buying the PGA. The... Yeah, or yeah, they totally bought the PGA. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's. 
This isn't Bitcoin. What's going no, on? And Scottish football, but nobody cares. So let's move bring on. it. Bring it back to Bitcoin. Uh, how good was that convo with Dom though? What a great idea. Like just like put a uh, arbitrary amount of sats aside right now. And then eventually when we know it's going to buy ourselves a golf course, like <laughs> that's a fucking fantastic idea. It, like, is. it is a good idea. Right. And it's thank you very much for sending us, sending him our way. Yeah, well, top bloke. Was, yeah, I, was, I had a quick chat to him about mining at home, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, he brought that up. I was like, "You got to talk to Hudson Brenda." Then what he, he, was, he was a nice guy, lovely guy. He was. It's still quite astounding that he's found he's got where yeah. he is by himself too. So social oh. media, and so quick, like twenty twenty one, I think. Like, yeah, really, hats off to him because he's 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 well down the, mm. you know, well down the path of understanding in such mm. a short time. You know. Um, anyway, what's new with you, mate? Been a oh, long time. What's new with me? What's new with me? Fiat, fiat life still, still tethered to the fiat slave minds, but uh, you know, one more on, cycle, this, boys. I think. But is that like a? Have you made a conscious choice? I mean, I know you're still working in Bitcoin. We can talk about that too. But um, like, are you making? Have you now made a conscious choice? Going, hang on, I can actually make. I can. I'm good at my job. I don't mind the job. But the fiat side of it is a, a nightmare. But I can actually make good money, stack good amount of sats, and then get get to where you want to be quicker is that is that a conscious choice for you definitely yeah, yeah. that's what it's all about yeah, yeah. It makes sense man yeah hustle now you know uh put the hard work in it's a, it's always a balance when you you know got a young family um but that's kind of the reason i, I took a, a role change uh in my fit job uh this year just to spend a bit more time at home which has worked out really well um you know not stacking as much fit uh albeit but you know i'm you know money's not everything hey you spend a bit more time with the kids and yeah you know, yep. kids are, kids are getting older now they're you know sort of six and nine they're starting to be really cool you know want want their dad around want to spend a bit more time with dad like archie my eldest one he's mad in the soccer so he just wants to get in the park and kick the ball every day so it's nice just to be home and be able to do that with him which is cool is fletch still think he's sonic no, nah, he moved on to Mega Man for a bit. Uh, yeah, at the moment, yeah, he he he. Uh, Mario's the number one. Yes, dude, at the moment, yeah. Thanks to the Nintendo Switch, Heck what's yeah. he got? Yeah, he, uh, he just got one of those. I don't know, new Mario ones, and he's obsessed with it. And then he saw a clip, so I got to probably pony up the sats for a trip to Japan next year because he's seen some bloody Mario World at Universal Studios. So oh shit, yeah. Oh shit, dad's yeah. gonna dad's gonna have to pony up some sats, I think, and take them. Probably next year. Nice. Oh, mate, we might have to coordinate because I'm desperate to go. Are you? Yeah, <laughs> so fuck, fuck, let's do it. To Tokyo. Fuck yeah. Oh, well, we, were, we were apparently going to Japan. Anyway, that's just really? it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. invited me. Um, well, there was a, there's a NOSTA conference in November. Uh, so I was like, oh, that might, that might work out all right. Chris this coming no November. Reason. No. Uh, yeah, this coming November, there's a NOSTA conference. I don't, I don't know what the name of it is. Don't put me on the spot, but uh, there is, there's a NOSTA conference coming in. There's one in Austin, I think, this year, and there's also one that's holding a, the same sort of conference in Japan, I believe, is the way the story goes. Where are you with NOSTA? Like, what are you, where are you spending your time? Uh, look, Twitter's got their little, you know, they've got me it's hooked. Um, I mean, it's hard because I spent a bit of time there because we've got, you know we're starting to get a decent amount of followers there right so yeah fish where the fish are um you know people who aren't bitcoiners aren't on nosti yet Mm -hmm. arguably most of our stuff for looking glass is targeted towards people who don't have bitcoin yet um albeit you know we we kind of speak to the bitcoin audience so it's a fine line there but i like the idea of nosta and i don't know if you guys saw max demarco's documentary that launched this morning i'm about 20 minutes through it it's about half hour documentary fantastic he's uh interviewing jack dorsey and andy pitt from ego yep. death capital and there was another gentleman i can't remember his name uh who was a co-founder of twitter at the time so they're just talking about all the parallels around when they started twitter what was exciting you know around that sort of um the birth of the internet and the birth of these protocols and just talking about the correlations between like a fundamental oh well not the correlations the differences really between fundamental underlying protocols like Bitcoin is a fundamental underlying protocol, TCPIP is a f- fundamental underlying protocol versus what we now know as social media is more like websites um, mm. where we're beholden to those people uh, using their service for data storage where um, you know we have to rely on the algorithms that they write for us to present the content presented for us where they're just talking about how NOST is just going to completely change and revolutionize the way we do social media as a protocol and talking about this idea around developing algorithms 
for other people that you can sign up to, right? So if you are a progressive person, you might want to opt in for that left-leaning sort of algorithm. And there may be services built on top of that and apps built on top of Nostar that will, you know, those clients will give you those algorithms. So you can very much opt into what it is that you want. And that that might be good and bad in a way, but it's just interesting to think about, I think, from that perspective where, you know, you might not be able to have the technical skills to write your own algorithm, but hopefully, you know, as this sort of grows, then maybe you can opt into that sort of thing or completely opt out. It's like, I don't want any censorship. I don't want any algorithm. <laughs> I just mm. want you to present to me what's ranking the highest or, um, or or what comes on my feed. What was the last, um, you know, tweet out of the people that I follow? What was the last one to drop? I don't want any censorship. I just think it's mind blowing where this thing's going to go. And it's so early. And I think like we're on the precipice of where Bitcoin was in, you know, the, the, I wouldn't say the very early stage. Cause we, you know, it was um, as far as the internet protocols are concerned, we're probably a bit further down the road, but probably, you know, equivalent to 2011 kind of Bitcoin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's pretty early. It's pretty early. It's um, you know, it's really cool as well. Like I was, so I'm an Android guy, Android desktop guy, and I was using um, what was I using? Um, Amethyst on the phone, which works pretty well, quite like it. But I was using a thing called Iris on the desktop, which to begin with I, I quite enjoyed, and then it just seemed to just be really buggy and slow for me. Maybe it's just me, but anyway, I, um, Brisk, I think it was suggested um, Primal, which I then gave a word to, and it is brilliant. But the yeah. best thing about it is, you know, you just as you is exactly what you're just saying, it's opt in. So like I just took myself and put myself from my whatever it was, Iris, to Primo. And all of the people I was following, I'm following still. I'm with you, yeah. Like, I don't have to do anything. It's just there. So it's like all of a sudden if something so let's say you're you know, you're a progressive person, you're following that thing and it then it gets to the point where you're not enjoying it so much anymore and you want to make a switch to something a bit more central or a bit further right or whatever you want to do, you can do that. And you take all of your the people you're following and the people who follow you with you. So, like, it's like keeping keeping the bastards honest, right? Yeah, then that's awesome. Like, if I could, you know, take my followers from from Twitter, take my take my audience from you know, or my, my uh, connections through Facebook. Like, I'm on I'm on Facebook. I rarely go on Facebook. I fucking hate Facebook, but the worst. you know, I run my side hustle. So it's kind of a mm-hmm. evil necessity. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, so for for my gigs and stuff, I communicate everything through Facebook. My my the people who come and find me are on Facebook. I would just love to s- cut those ties with that and just say, you know what, I'm over on this platform now. It still works. It integrates, and I'm going to talk to you through this from now yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so tricky, isn't it? It's like I because I understand people are like, oh, but you know, you just you're you're worried about losing your clout and. And it's not really that. It's like it's. There's two things about it. Like one, you you, you said before, you you want to still be. It is a it is a bit of an echo chamber of Bitcoiners in there just now, which is great. Nothing wrong with that. But it's just like if you're if you're doing something that's trying to reach out to a bit wider than just Bitcoiners, even or on something totally different in terms of music, like you can't do it there just yet. Yeah, but it's it's going to be slow. But it's just going yeah. to be a transition. It's just like how much. It will, yeah. It's like how you know you're hedging like what, where how much of your foot do you put in one and how much of your foot the well, other foot do you put in the other? Yeah, it is definitely as Dad said. It's, it's you got to fish where the fish are. Like my wife, mm-hmm. yeah, has her own business and she has to have socials. Like she's not a social media person, but mm. to actually get her gigs and her work, she's got to be where everyone is. So yeah, because nobody's sitting there going, "Oh, I'm going to go to you know johnsmith.com to read all about what you're doing." They want to just. They want it to they appear want you on to their be phone. Where, yeah, 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 they want yeah. you to be where they are, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, totally. And it's just. Um, so what's sorry? What's this documentary called? Is it just called Nostar? I think it's just called the Nostar documentary. The Nostar documentary. I think so. Nostar documentary. Yeah, Max Max DeMarco is his channel on mm-hmm. uh, YouTube. If you look him up there, um, and I think his Twitter handle is it's Max DeMarco. Used to be oh. Pleb Music. So if you search for that, I think oh, it's still packed straight away. I didn't realize that was. He's coming out of the closet. Yeah, right. It's like a little boy. Cres- Cresius or Cresius, yeah. Cresius. Cresius. Yeah. He became Jesse Myers. Yeah, Jesse, yeah. yeah Somebody else has done it, right? I know, no. Your stuff. Hang on, I'll be back. I don't know any school parents. I, I it, Hats always gives me a dig because I don't know any parents or kids or whatever. You know, you know, Hannah's mum, Rebecca. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm the same, man. I'm hopeless. Oh, I'm fucking why, hopeless. Why, 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 does all that stuff? why should I care? 
I think I picked the boys up today early because we uh oh news news for the bee household. We got a puppy today. So, Ooh. Oh, an actual legit not ripped off scam puppy. Not ripped off scam puppy. This one actually arrived, so he got he got flown in of all things. But anyway, that's what kind of what, flown in? What kind of dog is it? Ah, uh, he's a cavoodle. Can you can we see it? Uh oh, near... nah, not right now. No. I think What's they're, that? I think they're actually trying to put him to sleep because he's a bit he's a bit freaked out. Yeah. The Cavalier King Charles Spaniel slash Poodle, yeah? You're all over it, mate. How do you know this shit? Because uh, I love dogs. I yeah. love it. Funny story. His name's Scout Satoshi B. Scout Satoshi B. Yep. I got Scout, it Scout's a cool name. I'd love a Scout for a like a kid's name too. That's a cool name. Yeah, that would be a cool kid's name. Yeah, so anyway, we're not really were... talking about Bitcoin, are we? Oh, what I was saying, yeah, what I was saying is I went to pick the kids up today and, uh, you know, wifey had to say, this is where the admin building is. You need to go here. You need to walk <laughs> through this door. And it's like, no, I had no idea. <laughs> oh, what, yeah. are we, what are we actually talking about? Well, I don't know. We Something about electricity. We're going to just go to the, So I think what we're, I think this is where this came about from was Daz talking about load balancing. Yep. Is, that, is that right? Oh, which you talked about before. So he was like, like grid demand and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 So I didn't know. Um, I thought it'd probably be worthwhile to revisit. I know I've, I've probably recorded a pod or two in the past about this, but um, probably not the Aussie guys. And no one really comes and listens to me. So I thought maybe it might be interesting because there's a few, been a few things recently around grid demand. And I think it's pretty pertinent with Australia as well. We had a, couple of good panels uh at bitcoin alive speaking about the challenges with integration of mining um, bitcoin mining in australia uh and i thought it's kind of pertinent because of the push that um our governments both state and federal are both pushing towards these net zero targets and what that may mean so i've done a fair bit of digging uh around the plans um and working within the industry intimately um, I come at this with a little bit of skepticism around what it actually looks like for us to go to a hundred percent renewables future, because that's ultimately the discussion at the moment is, is basically just pushing towards a hundred percent renewables. And that comes with a few issues, which I think is worth just sort of highlighting. And then, um, the opportunities that Bitcoin mining presents to that, um, you know, it, it basically solves a lot of the issues that are going to be presented if we go down that route. Uh, and and I guess the, the other important thing to highlight, just to couple with that, is the fact that nuclear energy does not seem to be entertained this mm-hmm. at this stage. There's been recently a few little talks with some ministers over in WA. Uh, also, Peter Dutton, I think, has come, come out um, saying nuclear should be on the agenda. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think at least a discussion and some more due diligence around nuclear energy because it is a uh it's a high capital intensive offering to 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 go out and build at the outset but once it's built it provides really cheap clean energy into the future albeit it does have some issues around waste management and you know, so a whole host of risks, but that's a big, I guess, opening. I don't know uh, if you guys had anything specifically you wanted to um, to start talking about that. Oh, go on. Up. Okay, I guess for me, I let's go to renewables first. So, it, what does a net zero um, environment look like? So, are we talking grid instability as far as you know when uh, you know wind, solar, all these kind of renewables are actually able to produce? and feed into the grid. Yeah. That's the ultimate issue with it. So wind technology uh, is 30% efficient at best. So that means that if you build a hundred megawatt farm, you could count on you being able to utilize that capacity 30% of the time. Okay. Mm. Just due to the intermittency of wind energy. Solar energy is a little bit worse. It's about 19%. And obviously that's due to the fact that you can't have it running 24 seven because the sun goes away. Right. So, um, and you got cloud issues and and storm issues and all that sort of stuff. So if we're going to go down this route, so our grids are, are a really complex web of interconnected generators across transmission networks. And I'll, I'll probably spend a bit of time talking about that and what that actually means um also uh if we've got time tonight um and 
in a nutshell, coal plays a massive part in our baseload um, energy generation within Australia. If we're going to replace that, we have to build out a grid. So if wind is 30% at best, it stands to reason that if we're going to go and start turning off these coal-fired generators, we're going to have to build out a grid that is three times our maximum demand. Now, maximum demand is basically what the uh, what the market the market effects of everybody coming home and turning on their light switches at once. So, typically in Australia, uh, in through the summer months. Uh, our maximum demand is typically between around three till nine o'clock at night. Everyone gets home from school. They turn on their TVs. They you know fire up the computers. They turn the air conditioners on. Mum comes home. Dad comes home. Everyone's cooking dinner. Uh, you know that that's the period where we experience our maximum demand. So, in a grid system, you have to have the generational capacity running, ready to go, with enough headway in that system in order to be able to satisfy the maximum demand at the time that it's required. So it's not one of these things where we can store energy or have it readily available yet um, in, in a typical grid system. You've got to have that generational capacity. You've got to have generators spinning, ready to go with enough capacity. So um, if you think about a, 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 I don't know if you guys have got a camping generator, a, a generator you might have um, for your home or camping or like that. They're typically... For camping, you're gonna want, or well, for home backup, you're gonna want at least a, sort of two kilowatts. When you fire that generator up and it's idling, picture your like lawnmower idling, right? It's it's not doing much work. So out of that two kilowatts capacity, it's only just humming away. It might be humming away and burning through a couple of hundred watts of that capacity just by virtue of having to spin mm -hmm. uh, and be ready to go. So when you, you've you got basically then that capacity, that spare capacity up to two kilowatts, that's what it's rated up to. So that's a really simple way of just looking at a grid, like in a mini form. The only difference being we've got many of these different generational assets spread out throughout the whole country in interconnected, in a massive interconnected transmission grid. And we will send, we, we use price signals in order to communicate to those generators whether they're going to turn on or turn off or how much generation they're going to be able to provide at any one time. So it's it's a forecasted sort of um, pricing signal mechanism through the market, through the, um, uh, the uh, national electricity market, the NEM. Uh, and those price signals are always going through to these generators to say they're forecasting that sort of demand, right? So we know summer's coming through. We know, you know, using bomb data and all this sort of thing that this week's going to be really hot. So we expect everyone to turn their air conditioners on, um, you know, when they get home this this week. So we're going to bid, we're going to try and forecast that through price signals through generators to incentivize them to turn on in order for them to have generational capacity ready for when everybody does come home, switches on their lights, those machines are spinning ready to go with that capacity available. Does that is that market open all the time? Does like are people are people buying twenty four hours a day, seven days a 20, week the market yep. and the price signal is what determines what's happening? Yeah, they they typically communicate in I think it's five minute intervals now. Don't quote me on this. I'm not intimately familiar with the electricity market, but mm -hmm. um, five to thirty minute intervals. Okay. interval data so um they will bid for that as well um and and then they will forecast that and then they're basically you know signing up to say we'll be there we'll be ready to go uh when that that market hits and the inverse is also true for um if you then have too much capacity on a system too much generational capacity what ends up happening and this is the danger as we approach 100% renewables, and we're not quite there yet, okay? So uh, as we've had more solar come online, we've got solar farms, we've actually got one of the biggest markets of um, domestic rooftop solar in the world. Uh, I don't know the exact figures. Um, I did know them, but I, I can't can't think of them off the top of my head and I don't want to uh, you know, steer anyone up the garden path, but we've got one of the highest penetrations of that. And that puts stress on the system whereby these generators have to have a minimum load in order to be able to run stable. So as the sun starts shining through the day, say if we've got um, you know a couple of these generators running, but we then all of a sudden have way too much solar come onto the network mm. uh, that starts to soak up all of the demand, 
then all of a sudden we've got an issue because these generators can actually reach instability levels. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, issues with that, but one of them being frequency. So you can actually start to have your frequency. Your machines run too fast. They've got no load bogging them down, creating a, an opposing force on the, on, the, on the flywheel. And they can actually run into higher frequency. So in Australia, our heartbeat for our electricity system is 50 hertz. So um, that's that's basically um, uh, you know that's the best way to describe it and to look at it is, is is the heartbeat of the system. So if you don't have enough load and you've got too much solar generation on these spinning machines, will actually start to run a bit faster and it will result in a higher frequency. And machines like our electro our, our appliances and so forth don't like fluctuations in electricity. Because what it ends up um, doing in, in the frequency is it it's, then affects everything else. So all those other generators are then starting to chase it. Um, and the inverse is also true. If we put too much load on the system and we don't have enough generational capacity, those generators will bog down in the frequency. Um, and that was our typical situation in years gone by. That was our main issue most of the time is, is too much load, not enough um, capacity. And we used to have um, uh, under frequency load shedding schemes all throughout the state, whereby if you if you had a situation where I don't know one generator blew up, it's just stopped working, and you had a really um, uh, quick drop in that generational capacity, we would send signals to start shedding load all through the state. We'd start dropping off big load centers. I'm talking like whole towns. You would just cut them dead in order to try and maintain the stability. Um, that's less of an issue now. We're starting to see this uh, over-frequency issue where we've got too much generational capacity through solar because we don't have as much control over it, but we've still got to have these generators on, these coal-fired generators on, because that's our secure base load supply, and they are generally what provides the signal for everything else to latch onto. Mm-hmm in order to to be able to to, to spin. So you've got a, you've got a a reference voltage right? You've got nice, steady 50 hertz signal. Everything else starts to sync onto that same network at a, at a wider scale. So when that's, that base load is affected, that's when you, you've got right, major issues on your grid. What? I, was, <clears throat> I was just going to say, do you, like in your opinion, do you think that kind of governments and politicians actually understand what you're saying? Like other than just saying, Let, we've got to go net zero because this is what is best for the planet do they understand the ramifications of actually really driving towards that rapidly <laughs> which they're obviously I, funded. I, I would say no in general no um the the studies that have come out to their credit so um so the isp is um uh it's it's a it's a plan that the um, market operator aemo is the um market operator they've put out many studies they, they're well aware of the issues um i would say for politicians and mps who you know off the cuff make a lot of these decisions no um they they wouldn't understand this um to to any sort of uh de- 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 degree of understanding but um to their to their credit like i was saying a lot of the plans that they've put in place actually do um address these issues of instability in the grid um and what does a 100% renewable grid look like um, while maintaining a certain level of reliability? So the underpinning thing about that, just to go back, I think I might have started touching on this and got a little sidetracked, but um, if we're to go 100% renewable uh, and if wind is 30% efficient at best, we are going to need a grid that is three times our maximum demand. And that will just give us enough variability in that headway of having enough generational capacity through these renewable projects in order to cater for the maximum demand. The big question mark around that is who's going to pay for the capitalization of a grid that is three times the maximum demand Mm -hmm. when you know you're not going to get revenue back for that extra two thirds because the revenue is only ever going to get sold at sort of one third, right? So who pays for that? And if there's not somebody there to soak up that excess demand guess what that's you bungees with your yeah. power bills yeah and taxes that's and also what's a, like a coal power plant can be i'm not saying they're building them but a coal power plant can be built close enough to the population that it's trying to serve a windmill has to go where it's windy 
right? And that might not be exactly where you want it to be um, practically as well, because you also got to send that power over distance, and then obviously it dissipates as it travels. Right. Yeah, that's a good. That's a great point. Um, so we do have quite a sophisticated and large transmission network, but it's mainly relegated to the coast, east coast, or like east coast. like the Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria all feed each other, and then yeah, great then question. Have, is that true? Yes. And, so Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, and South Australia and are South connected. Australia. Okay. Uh, Western WNT. Australia don't care about. They're out on their own. They can. Are they just purely by themselves? The WA, and then what yep. about the territory? Uh, they're on their own as well. Yeah, okay. they're not connected to the main grid. Okay. Yeah. So it is the case where if, you know, if there's a storm hits in Queensland, powers could be fed from New South Wales to Queensland. That that happens. That currently happens. All the time. Yeah. Right. So Queensland's actually a net exporter of energy. Yep. Um, New, New South Wales is a net importer. Victoria um, actually flips around a little bit. And mm-hmm. Tassie, as much as they... Uh, you know, like to stamp their feet and say that they're 100% renewable, which they are. Uh, they All of their generation comes from hydro. Well, I think they might have a little bit, but the majority of their, um, they've got they've got access to a lot of, lot of water, a lot of uh, hydro, a lot of dams that provides most of theirs, but they also do import a lot from the other states. So they can't actually hang their hat on yeah. to say we're 100% renewable because who knows what the mix is coming in from the other states. So there's a really cool website, actually, if anyone's interested in mucking around with this stuff, it's called opennem.com. And you can go and you can have a look at all the, uh, uh, that particular thing I'm talking about, it's called stripes in the left-hand panel. You go up there and you have a look at the stripes and you can go in and see the load flows between each of the states. You can go and have a look at all the generators, what type they are, whether they're hydro generators, uh, their gas, their coal, black coal, brown coal, massive lot of information on there. It's, It's pretty fun to dig around, but maybe that's just me. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 so, what, um, what, in your opinion, is the best uh, renewable? Is it is it hydro? Hi, hydro is fantastic. Um, and actually, one of the really cool things is is pumped hydro. So, I'll give you an example. There's one, there's a place up here called Kidston where where I live, and I've actually done a little bit of work on this um, with the their grid connection. Um, and I've just actually commissioned late last year. One of the last things I did before I changed roles was commission some load for these guys so they can use their pumped hydro. So what they've got, it's an old gold mine and there's two massive big open pits and they're both full of water. One just happens to be higher than the other topographically. Mm. So they're going to drill down between the higher pit and the lower pit, put hydro in there. Um, hydro generators and the idea will be when times are good and those load and, and the price signals are, are and they've also got a massive solar farm there I forgot to yeah, mention that this is what this huge, is, yeah, this. huge solar farm so what they're going to do is when the um, times are um uh, are not as profitable to be exporting to the grid for their solar they will use that power to fire up their pumps and they'll pump water from the lower dam up to the higher dam Yep. And then at night time, typically when uh, the demand increases and those um, generational uh, pricing signals really start to skyrocket, yep. they'll just say, yep, we'll take some, we'll fire up the the um, hydro and we'll just release water from the top. So it's basically essentially a massive battery. Now, that's exactly, uh, yeah, that's, that's just awesome. a rechargeable battery, right? That's awesome. Yeah, um, so- yeah it, it's, really, it's really fucking cool. The problem is... Um, to do that at scale for everything that we need would mean massive environmental destruction. Yeah. So and some places have water and some places don't have water in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that that's true. But you know, with with the the, the idea being that they uh, they're going to build a big one. I don't know exactly where it is. Actually, it's down South Queensland or something like that. They're going to put a new hydro dam in. But you know. What I take a bit of exception to is the these greenies are all about going to this 100% renewables, but I'll turn a blind eye to the environmental destruction of like building a new dam. Like that's just the wildlife and, you know, and they can do all the studies that they like, but if there's an agenda out there to push the narrative a certain way, they'll turn a blind eye of wiping out certain possums and frogs. Well, that's, and- what, well, that's why I always see or like hippies, oh, I don't want to say hippies, but, you know, environmentalists that, uh, protesting about you know cutting trees down and all that kind of stuff, but they're the ones driving around in um, combis. So yeah. there you go. And same, yeah. same like you know, ultimately all the hippies were um, you know real and and Greenpeace very vehemently against nuclear. Whereas like if they had to let that technology go, 
you, mm. you could you argue that we wouldn't be in the shit storm we are now with you know if if you buy into some of the the ESG sort of narratives and the climate change narratives like oh, I've still got some question marks around that if I'm going to be perfectly honest but you know I haven't I haven't done enough work to really hitch my wagon either way I do know that there's some very perverse incentives pushing us down certain narratives in certain to certain extents but um and I think there's also a lot of the opposing climate science, which isn't discussed, it's just censored. So there's a really good book um, by a guy named um, Steve Coonan. Uh, it's called Unsettled. Great book. He was actually a climate modeler um, for one of the administrations in the US. And um, he's just got some big question marks around how we go about spruiking the, the data that we're using, you know, uh, it, not, to, not to sort of get, get too sidetracked, but um, when you observe... There's this, there's this um, sort of overarching testament. I, I forget the, I forget the name of, um, of of the fellow who's come up with this. But basically, when you observe something, you inherently change it. It's just a fact in all things. It's like a, a thing with quantum mechanics. When you and when you when you're dealing with like molecular structures and atoms and so forth, that that that's absolutely true. When you when you abstract it a little bit further out, your input on that observation becomes a little bit less impactful. But um, basically what he posits is that the the fact that we're observing this now is ultimately creating a lot more trends than what other would, would otherwise exist through 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 sort of history and one of those things being the invention of s- semiconductors and the improvements in electronics and our ability to observe things in a better way in a more accurate way in a more precise way through the through technology right so a lot of the trends the observational trends that we're seeing is because we're able to sample those that data a lot finer and we're looking at a trend from the 1970s onwards and you couple that with long-term temperature cycles and it becomes not as obvious because we are if you look at long you know and they can do all this through ice um deep deposit ice sheets, they can, you know, carbon date, they can do all of these sort of clever things to predict and model what the temperature cycles have been over thousands of years, not just from 1970 onwards. So our the, the whole point of that was from 1970, our electronics improved markedly. But, and so our ability to observe the changes in temperature are a lot more improved. And it could be argued that if you were to zoom out, we're just observing this rise in temperature, which we absolutely are observing, but it's this part of a bigger wave cycle. And guys who are listening to this can't obviously see my hand signals to, mm-hmm. to you guys, but looks like a wave. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like a you're small part of the penis, actually. <laughs> about, that, about that, I'm glad you. Thanks, appreciate you using both hands. Yeah, well, actually, I was going to say it's the old nose. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Schnauzer's warehouse. Oh, they make your face grass. grass. Yeah. See, this is this is my issue with this whole, this whole topic, right? Is that everybody seems to have their agenda. They they have their incentive, their own personal take, and their own. They're looking at oil, they're looking at coal, they're looking at solar, and they will promote the side of the argument that they fit. Of course, right? I understand that, but also, like for example, you've got the guys who are talking about you know flared gas. That is now they're now cleaning up the flare gla- gas and they're running bitcoins off bitcoin miners off the flare gas and that's obviously a better yeah sure I hundred percent agree. However, what that also does is if you have a pollutant rest- a pollution restriction on that um on that um what am I trying to say tower I guess I don't know what I'm trying to say like on what am I trying to say the mis- the, the, the the pit where it's flare now, the, 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 this isn't good <laughs> the tower thing. <laughs> we don't know like, what we're talking about, believe it or not, Daz. No, I, no, I don't. This is what. No, but this is why we. This is why we want Daz. It. And, and, yeah, right. yeah. So, if you are flaring, if you're flaring gas and you're taking that flare gra- gas to run a Bitcoin miner, right? All of a sudden, um, you can run that. That becomes more economical to run more often. You're cleaning things up, so you're actually producing more as well. So there's neg- there's negative effects there too. What I'm trying to say is that there's positive and negative effects with every form of energy production, right? And nobody's sure. prepared. Nobody's really prepared to discuss the, the the other side of the argument. It's a bit like the COVID argument, right? Like one side of the argument will t- talk about one thing, one side of the other argument will talk about another thing, but nobody will get two smart people in a room just to have a conversation that we can all listen to the conversation and make our judgments based on the conversation mm. rather than being told what our opinion should be. 
And I think right, that's and just hopefully a... I saved myself looking like an absolute article there. <laughs> no, no, totally, totally. Get you what you're with me? Is that is that fair? Absolutely. And I think if if we can tie it back to an early conversation, I think it's like social media is ruining people's ability to talk. You know, and think because exactly, and to have a sound argument or a sound debate, like now we just get so frothy because you're hiding behind a keyboard, you don't get punched in the face yeah. anymore. You know what I mean? So it's ruining yeah. society from that respect because now. We don't know how to converse in a civil way because we're not used to doing it face to face where that is a risk of getting punched in the face. Mm -hmm. So now we're so far removed, but now, you know, we, we put all these protections in place and, and whatnot, but like people are going to those levels straight away. It's not like, let's have an open discussion about it. Let's go. You're a fucking idiot and go, you know, full hog on those discussions. And I think it erodes even, even down into media and science to a certain degree. Mm. It's just, we as people, we as a society are just not used to conversing and having differences of opinion. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, a little example, we've got an airline that just cancelled flights from our hometown and I just saw that it was Facebook, so I apologise for doing that. But um, <laughs> but it's like, and you know, so it's a local community, it's a small community and it's just people just slinging on and at each other with yeah. because as you say, there, there's, there's no repercussions and no consequences so people just they would never do it in it's face toxic -face contact it's toxic and and then you know it, it just creates then a platform of acceptance for censorship yes so people are like yes you should censor that guy because he's an idiot like you know like yeah. just so frothy over it that just you know and and you know censorship should just never be and it's just totally leaked into science like it's if you're not on my team you're a conspiracy theorist. Which, you know? well, like, the whole the whole uh, process of science is somebody questioning somebody else, come, you know, and then forever questioning well, to you, improve or our outcomes, right? Well, that's science. Or trying to disprove your own theory. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the how you should be taking it. To totally. To and it so comes down to that. You should be able to argue the other side of any, you know, if, you, if you're really being true and correct to yourself, you should be able to argue the other side. If you've really explored... Um, the mm. the from from your perspective if you've really explored the you know that you are right then you should have done that work and i just don't think it it gets done you know so and that's where maybe an energy mix would come in like if we if we got five intelligent people in the room all discussing their their the thing that they were um positive about and then they got to a point where it was like okay well maybe we should have a 35 percent coal and a 22 percent solar and a 14% wind and whatever, you know, and we have nuclear at three or whatever. And that then becomes, a more, to me, I think becomes a more reliable, um, stable, um, something goes wrong in one, we make a mistake, we can adjust, you know, all these kind of things it just makes sense to me. But I don't yeah. understand where these people, maybe people are, are out there and they're trying to do this. I don't, I don't know. Well, t I guess talking about stability, like where does Bitcoin mining come into this? So basically, I kind of touched on before that we'd have to build that grid out to three times the size if we're just looking at 100% renewable. Um, and that's where Bitcoin mining can really play a part is to monetize and capitalize on that excess capacity because it does have to be paid for. Mm. So, you know, if you've got a grid that's three times the size and your maximum demands only one third of that at any, any you know, any one time, then that two thirds is basically sitting there. It's been capitalized. It's been built out. Now, there are some things that they're looking at in order to to capitalize on that, um, such things as hydrogen production. So hydrogen is an, an, an option to you basically produce hydrogen using your excess capacity, and then you can store that hydrogen and then use that then to put back into the grid and into the hard times. And that does give you a little bit of variability. So maybe we don't need three times, but we can bring that down a little bit. But even hydrogen in and of itself is um, super inefficient with current technology. It's about 30%. Oh. Um, uh, at best. So, you know, you, you're burning two thirds of that to produce 30% in the future. Uh, they are talking about creating export markets for the hydrogen because we're really lucky in Australia. We're actually one of the countries that could actually do 100% renewable. We could actually do it mm -hmm. because we have so much, you know, sun. Space, it comes back to your point. All that kind of stuff. A lot of sun. Exactly. And it comes back to your point earlier. Um, uh, hats around having to build out that grid, like, you know, the sun and the wind generation, like you said before, it's not always near the population centers that are going to consume it. So you do have to, there's extra expense then to build out those grids. 
So the other way that Bitcoin can play, Bitcoin mining can play a part in that is co-location. When you uh, have one of these um, projects that you got to stand up, one of the most expensive parts is that transmission connection because it involves substations, which are really expensive um, ways of stepping up voltage onto transmission level. That plant, the control systems, the space, the land required for all that, super, super expensive is one of the major inputs into that. Um, so you could do this in a staged approach whereby you could mobilize portable mining solutions in by containers. You go and you build out your wind farm and you say, yo, let's give us access to this electricity on the cheap. We might not be able to um, use that at, at um, in a hundred percent of the time, therefore we're going to need to come to some sort of a arrangement around pricing. But we can park that load directly next to you and monetize your project straight away as you continue to build out and then build your um, your connection to the grid where that's your main customer. So as a, as an energy producer, that's your main customer is the grid. Well, it's your only customer as as one of these operators so you're you're introducing optionality then for them to be able to you know it's a secondary market for energy then yeah it's like well maybe i do co-locate with some miners and and you know either do it themselves which is a, an ideal scenario that's what i'd be doing if i was a mm. well capitalized um energy producer uh is is have a fleet of these myself uh whereby i know where all my economics are and i know where all my fat is and i know where all my spare capacity is and i just mobilize these as my projects get built out and i move move them on to the next one either that or you partner with a uh in a revenue sharing model with some um you know loaded plebs in the next cycle giddy up boys <laughs> hang so, on so you're it's going to mean okay. so you're in the industry right are you seeing any of any energy producers speaking to bitcoin miners to talk about these projects or is it is it all going the other way is all bitcoin miners going come talk to us come talk, talk to, to us, us guys yeah, yeah. yeah so um i'm not probably i don't necessarily interface with those energy producers directly myself yep. so i no i can't say that i have had conversations with other people um and uh sort of we had a good discussion around this at bitcoin alive so hopefully that um that discussion uh, recording should come out shortly actually mm. i think they're around up to the end of the day as they were slowly mm. releasing those videos. Um, but th those people who have had those conversations, there is no appetite for this discussion um, yet. from the regulators yet. So it's one of those things. Um, the more people keep hassling them about it, I think they're going to have to start to pay attention to this. Um, I don't want to speak sort of too out of turn, but I've been approached by somebody whose family members quite prominent in the Australian space uh, as far as the sciences are concerned and uh, has a voice within the the regulators and we're trying to tee up a meeting to uh, get some of the some of the um, the players who who know to speak to this intelligently to to at least just get them to consider it that's all we're asking we're, we're not asking for the you know a marriage with Bitcoin mining or anything like that but we very much see we don't see you know okay I don't see Bitcoin mining being able to soak up all two thirds of that excess capacity but it definitely can play a part like that might only be 5% of that excess capacity, you know, but it's still a way to reduce the costs on taxpayers because we're ultimately the, the people, the the consumers and the taxpayers are ultimately the ones that are going to subsidize this excess capacity. Yes. Um, there are, like I said, hydrogen and other technologies that, that they're actively looking at to try and, you know, utilize that spare capacity. But it's ultimately what the ISP has stated and the Queensland Energy Jobs Plan have stated that we're going to need a grid that size if we're going to be serious about doing this without rolling blackouts. So I have to give them credit because a lot of the discussion that you see amongst, um, you know, uh, skeptics of this approach is that we're going to have rolling blackouts, which I was absolutely... Um, you know, had 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 my you know uh, stance against that as well. I was pretty vocal about that. That that needs to definitely be considered. And you know, you you put your tinfoil hat on. It's like, oh, they want us to be fucking eating baked beans out of you know <laughs> tins in the backyard and so forth. Which you know, I'm not totally convinced that's not the case. But anyway, at <laughs> least they're at least they've um it's put, reckon, put they're recognizing it. They recognize it. Um, you know, there's some very clever engineers in this country. Um, I've had some discussions internally with with my organization there's some interest i'm i'm kind of biding my time before i really go on because um, this is just the the bite of the cherry 
of the opportunities that I see on the ground from a distribution level. So maybe maybe I'll just step back, if, unless you guys have got any questions, but maybe I'll just step back and give you guys a sort of level around how that transmission network and the generators and the distribution level kind of gets, how you get power, how you get 240 to your home, if that's interesting. Please, go. Cool. cool. Um, so we've spoken about generators and we've spoken about the fact that they're dispersed all over the country in 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 various different, different centres. And obviously they're, uh, kind of located towards where those resources are. So if you've got coal, you're going to probably find a coal-fired generator somewhere around that area. So for Queensland, Gladstone, we've got quite a big... You on the red wine again, boys? Uh, again. Oh, is that out of mugs tonight? Uh, he, he always has glasses because he's uh, a, a, a tight ass. He doesn't want to break wine glasses. Hey, can I just speaking of tight ass? Sorry to get with Brenda. He doesn't trust me. That's what it is. <laughs> sorry to get uh, sidetracked on this, but are they new mics I've seen? I'm seeing here. Uh, this one is that one well, is uh, this new is the to one me, anyway, I've had for a while. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're well, and and we have we mentioned the paid for Zoom. <laughs> we mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Holy fuck! I we didn't notice oh, that at all. I know. Oh. We're shit coiners. Oh, we're, 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 yeah, yeah. We we actually pulled the pin out and and bought Zoom. And let's be let's be honest that Brendo bought Zoom. Yeah, what are we? He, he paid the bill. What can I tell you? He's he's big dogs. Big dogs paying bills now. Yeah. Well, once <laughs> I once I paid for that Airbnb when it was twenty four thousand for Bitcoin, I'm just throwing. Yeah, we'll shit on Airbnb at the oh, end. Like, oh, I should I should I should go and see what they stats are worth now. And um, oh, you probably know anyway. But I'll uh, I should just no. drop it back into that chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Wind up. I, I should I should have probably. Ponied up for the uh, the Airbnb damage. Can we talk about that? Oh, definitely. Airbnb oh. damage. Oh, mate, we we called them uh, Dick of the Day or whatever one yeah, of our they Dick of the Day because you listened to all of ours. Obviously, you, uh, you knew that Friday fuckwit. Yeah. No, I didn't hear the Dick of the Day. No, I didn't hear that episode. Who was that with? I missed that one. Uh, um, I listen to most. I listen to most. I'm not. I'm not your number one fan. Anyway, do you want to explain that then? Like what happened to Airbnb? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what was that? Six of us and one roaming guest uh, in this house. And, oh, Roger. Um, Roger. Roaming oh, Roger. Big Rog. Roman Rog. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we check out of this Airbnb. It was a nice, nice-ish place. A little bit mm. of disrepair. Like it's getting a bit old, but it was a big place. Nice, close to the water. Cost a couple of, you know, grand in Aussie cuck bucks for, <laughs> for a couple of days. Uh, we all split the bill. Thanks for the sats. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and then we we check out. We did a we did the rounds. We we looked around all all around the place. And about two weeks after we checked out of this joint, they sent me a uh, a claim through Airbnb to say that we broke the towel rail in the one of the bathrooms. Oh, was it and a like, towel rail? I thought it was a toilet roll thing. It was a towel rail, like a hand towel rail next to the basin in the and it was just like a standalone toilet. It wasn't in the bathroom. It was like a little. Little um ensuite toilet kind of thing, oh, okay. and um and yeah, so sent me a demand for four hundred bucks for this tiny little hole, tiny little hole in the jip rock. Uh, so anyway, I, I go back to them and said, oh look, there must have been a guest after us. It definitely wasn't us. Nicest pie about it. Yeah. Um, sorry for the misunderstanding. Because everybody had, every, lots of people had a good look around when we left. Just yeah, to yeah. everyone did. Nobody yeah. left anything. Others, yeah, we'd somebody would have noticed. Anyway. Every, yeah, everyone did. And then um, yeah. So anyway, I. It goes through to some Airbnb um, complaints, arbitrage, like mediation freaking service or something like that. And I didn't give it too much mind. I was just like, look, that definitely wasn't us. Like we would, you know, we're all grown men. We'd, you know, we'd admit to it. By the way, what the hell is with 400 bucks for a tiny hole in the jip rock? Like mm. who's this contractor <laughs> that you've got in kind of thing? And yeah, I think they're just taking the opportunity to get the freaking bathroom repainted, to be perfectly honest, rip it out mm. of the wall. And mm. they were... So I contacted the um, the property manager directly through Airbnb Messenger, and I said, "Hey, mate, this just wasn't us. Like, I'm really sorry, but it wasn't us." And he said, "Oh, don't worry about it. Just um, say it wasn't you, and Airbnb's insurance will pick it up." And so I'm like, "Oh, mm. okay." But no, Airbnb insurance didn't pick it up, and they they charged my credit card four hundred bucks. And you should have coming. screenshotted that conversation with the yeah. property manager. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even think about it. Anyway, <laughs> a quick experiment. I think we should count the three and all three of us say who we think would have done it if it was one of one of us. Ooh. You ready? Just out of us three? No, 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 out of the seven. Oh, I've got one. I'm going to say it. Ready? Oh, okay, ready? One. Ready? Yeah. 
One, one, two, two three, three. Brandon. T Bone. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was me. <laughs> I thought I was just thought Brendan's gonna say hats for sure, so it'll just be funny if I say it too. <laughs> T Bone. No, I reckon T Bone definitely did the reverse Kanga. <laughs> I'd never heard of a reverse Kanga until you told me about that. Oh man, it's the best. Oh. Actually, I, I don't even know. It's the best man it was you. Yeah, yeah. Go, uh, Google it on the Urban Dictionary. Look up that. <laughs> Urban Dictionary that. Sorry, uh, T Bone. I don't think it was you, but maybe oh. I do. I was just pleased that there was no upper deckers performed through the week. Oh well, that that I learned what an upper decker was that weekend. So you're welcome. You're welcome. So did I, but I forgot. I'm, I'm still traumatized oh, by the it, flicking out. Will okay. your yes. will your Sorry. audience appreciate an explanation of an upper decker? I think you need uh, to. Yeah, man. man, this is two bit idiots. Please, <laughs> nobody's, so an upper, nobody's listening anymore. Did upper you hear decker. Me? <laughs> Before <laughs> <laughs> an upper decker is where you're at a party and you take the lid off the cistern and you do a shit in the top half of the cistern, <laughs> so that oh yeah, that remember that. over time it disintegrates and then you flush and then you're just flushing shit and like it takes it takes a good like four or five <laughs> full flushes to get that out. That's got to be never, that's got to be a Queensland thing, mate. It's, it's, definitely, <laughs> it's definitely you that broke the towel rail. <laughs> And did we, uh, did we pay that back in sats? He sat at us twice. <laughs> he did the prick. <laughs> Mitch you know what I love? That's we've great. had this really nice, serious conversation about electricity grids, and then we've just gone to upper, upper decker. deckers yeah. and reverse kangas, I and mean, we're about to go back to electricity. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try and do that. Yeah, it, go on. It, it segues in so well because uh, in one of our substations, <laughs> 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 one of these blokes did an upper deck. No, actually, uh, that. We had a massive snake li- living in the cistern, uh, one of our substations. So snakes are pretty prolific within substations because there's lots of electronics. It's warm. We don't get they're not manned, so we don't go there all the time. But we get we get big issues with snakes, and I don't handle snakes. And anyway, there, we got two different substations, two different toilets. One there was a snake in the cistern. We're like trying to flush it, and like this oh, thing's no. jammed. What's going on? Take the lid off, and it was oh. just this massive python in the system Uh and another one he actually will swim through the septic tank pipelines into the toilet bowl because he'll eat the frogs whoa wow that's the other thing you'll be you know doing your business in one of these substations you just get this little little tickle on the under your leg and it's (laughs) just a little green tree frog you just lift these little arm and give you a little tickle oh that's awesome so anyway that's that's, that's how i segue back to the grid before we go back to the (laughs) To the grid, I got bitten by a redback on Sunday True. night. Yeah. How'd you go? It fucked me up for he's a day. He's superpowers and he's yeah, flying yeah. through New York. My, my, I, it, I think I was carrying firewood and I think it was, um, it, it, well, it definitely bit me on the gut and the belly. So I had like a baboon's ass for, for a belly for like a, like two days. So anyway. Yeah, they can uh, mess you up, eh? Yeah, yeah. They can't good. kill you though, redbacks, right? I don't think so. No, no, generally not, no. Funnel web, funnel web will fuck you. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Mm. I've got them in my garden, and the, the guy who cuts the grass stuck his finger in a hole, going, "Oh yeah, that's a funnel web." Yeah, what an idiot. No, well, he's yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I was like, "Don't do that, man." <laughs> but yeah, he was. He was hey, you know what's like a funnel web's web? The electricity yeah. grid. So, oh, nice. oh, yeah, back to oh, it. Yeah, yes, I'm gonna pro at these segways. I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, so, where where were we? I don't know. Generators. Yeah. Transmission grid. So generators yes. will generate at a certain voltage. Now, when we send power across, <laughs> I love that. I love geogra- that. Geographic regions, we've got to minimize losses. So we want to make that as efficient as possible. So what happens is when you send power across a uh, uh, transmission network, like your, your your wires that you see in your poles and wires. What you've got to try and minimize is the amount of current that flows through there. So as you've got current flowing through uh, a medium, it generates heat. That heat is a loss. And so what you're going to try and do is minimize the current. So power is directly proportional to voltage and current. So if we want to reduce current, we have to boost volts. And that's where the transmission network comes into play. So the transmission network is typically your really big steel towers, the really huge ones. They're in the back of not running through suburbia. You know, they're running between big load centers. So your generators will generate at a specific voltage. Um, Sometimes it depends on the generator. They can be as low as your normal 240 volt right up to, you know, into the low 
kilovolts. Um, and we will typically put that onto the transmission network, which throughout Australia is going to be 132 volts or 275, sorry, 132 kilovolts or 275 kilovolts. So that's 275,000 volts. So okay. your volts at your um, power point is 240. Yep. We're transmitting at 275,000 volts. So when you've got that much voltage, you insulation becomes a problem. And that's why these towers are so huge. And then they've got these big ass strings big of ass. glass. Big, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glass insulators to tether them to the to the um steel towers to make sure you've got enough separation electrically so that that voltage is not jumping out. Can you hear the puppy? Puppy's No, crying. I can't. He's crying right now. They must have gone to bed and left Aww. him in the dark. You know? <laughs> Chris will be up in a minute. She'll go and oh, him. Do She'll I have to? Do I have to beep that out? I've said it twice now. Yeah, oh, fine. Oh, dox the kids as well. Dox the dox the kids. Dox to everyone. Dox the dog. So <laughs> insulation. So <laughs> when you boost your volts, I'm like a scatterbrain, eh? So easily yeah. distracted. Uh, um, when you boost your volts, that insulation becomes a problem, and that's where transmission uh, networks are super expensive. So just stepping back when we've got to boost that up. When we boost that voltage up, it's through a substation. So these are these massive, big, they're like the size of a house, kind of mm, mm. on, on average, big steel um, transformers. And what they are is just basically warnings around a magnetic core. When you run an AC voltage through that magnetic core, it creates a magnetic field in that magnetic core. And then the windings are proportional to the step up or step down in voltage. So if you've got... Um, uh, I, I won't do public math, but if you've got uh, X amount of windings here, Y amount of windings, that ratio will stay constant. So if you've got 240 volts here, you can actually boost that up to as much as you like through that core, as long as you've got the power ratings and enough room to put all those windings on. So those windings um, through that transformer, through that substation, those yards have typically got protection systems and a whole host of really complicated uh, electronics in there to make sure that that all works and it's all safe, massive, big circuit breakers. Um, and then we will step that up onto the, those transmission towers and we'll transmit that power all up and down the coast, right up through, like I was saying, right up to the top of um, sort of where, where I am in Cairns um, is, is, is typically the, the, the longest part of that transmission network, right down to Tassie um through through those um poles and cables we do also use underground cables obviously over the tassie it's an undersea cable so that voltage is unusable at our homes mm. so then what we've got to do is we've got to step that voltage back down again so why we've done that is to minimize the current when we're sending it really vast distances so that we're maximizing how much power we're sending to the other end minimizing yep. our losses Yep. When we get it to bigger load centers, so say you hit cans, we will step that down to what we call a sub-transmission level. So we've got bulk supply points. These are really big substations in key strategic locations in these bigger locations. And we will step that down from 275 down to a typical sub-transmission voltage is around 66 kilovolts. So that's still 66,000, but it's a little bit better to handle. And then we're going to send all that out to other substations all around the place. So these are smaller substations and, and these smaller substations will take the sub transmission network and we step it down again to a distribution voltage level. So that is typically throughout Australia, either 22,000 volts or 11,000 volts. And that's your typical poles and wires that you see around your homes. So your, your normal wooden poles You'll see probably down your way, I think you might have 11, 11 kV. And it's quite common for you to see two sets of wires. The top one will be the a high voltage. So that'll be your 11,000. And then you might see four wires down on along the cross arms just underneath that as it sort of goes around your neighborhood. And that'll be actually be your low voltage. So when we get around to like, say, a street level, we'll put a transformer either on the pole or on the ground. Uh, and that transformer steps it down again from 22,000 down to 240 mm. or 415 across three phases. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going into your home. Mm. So where is the loss then, Daz? Like, does the loss, uh -huh. like if you're stepping up to really high voltage in a massive long, long distance transmission, is it, but it's long distance, obviously. So is that where the, is that where the loss is or is the loss more locally because it's lower voltage and everywhere? Hotter? 
or just every yeah. like over time, over distance, everything. Okay, yeah. Just, there'll there'll be losses in every step of the way through that through that whole system. Um, yeah. So nothing's an obviously a hundred percent conductor. So even sure. though we're boosting that really really high, like on high load days, um, you'll you'll still have losses there. So uh, oh, I actually used to know some figures around losses, um, but I think in a typical transmission grid, I don't know if this is just Queensland, but we kind of estimate around six percent loss. Okay. From your generate just from transmission, uh, just trying to get it to where it needs to go. Got you. Got you. So here's why I was asking, right? So let's say you were Daz is in charge and you've got 50 years um, or 100 years or whatever you need. Is it better for, to have a national grid and transmitting all over the country? Or, you know, I guess it might be different for different countries, but, or is it better? Is, is local power generation better? Um, local power generation is better in terms of efficiency, it, yeah, but nationwide better for reliability. So, what you're effectively doing is you're introducing a lot of um effective redundancy in your in your assets when you've got a lot of interconnected networks. So, yeah, uh, a, a town might be a good example. So, uh, a mesh network. So, we've got what we call on the distribution side of that that argument. So, when we're talking about the twenty two thousand, the eleven thousand kV, when you're designing a town, you will have it's always ideal to have as much of a mesh network as possible, which means you've got lots of feeders coming out of a substation. So out of a substation, we might send, you know, let's just pick a number, five feeders out of that. So five different circuits, and we'll call them different things. So this is North Cairns, West Cairns, East Cairns, South Cairns. And we're going to send that out uh, in those various directions. But when, you know, obviously there's a lot of those suburbs overlap, so what you would try and do is pick a lot of tie points in there. So if we ever needed to do any work, say, at back at the substation level on this particular bit of breaker to make sure it maintains and it's behaving all uh, like it can, we want to be able to take that feeder out, but we don't want anyone to lose power. So we'll go out on the network and we'll actually tie those feeders together in a, what's called a mesh network. So you're trying to introduce redundancy in that system so that you're minimizing the time that people spend because ultimately the time, you know, energy use is revenue. So you want to be maximizing your revenue at all times, which means you don't want anybody to be off out of power at any stage when you can minimize it. So we always plan. Yeah. It's got to be a pretty drastic situation to have a planned event that results in customer minutes lost. Which is and it's customer. nothing to do with the customer; it's just to do with the money coming in the door. Really? Uh, no, we're actually we are actually regulated. We actually do have. Well, it is money. It is. It all ties back into money. But there's um actually incentives. So we've got um targets to meet for. They call it SADI and safety. So it's a duration index and a, a frequency index, which means, uh, so if you've got a really long rural feeder, um, typically they're radial, so there's no ability to tie. If we're going out in the middle of the boondocks, we're not going to build out a mesh network at net mesh network out there. We call that a radial feeder. So it's going out to the middle of nowhere and there's no way for us to tie that back into anyone else. So if they have an outage for whatever reason, a tree drops on and takes a line out, they're going to be without a power. The two factors that we measure then is duration. So how long was the customer out for? And then if it's a really shitty bit of network, like with without much protect or to, maybe too much protection or um or really problematic run that goes through trees or goes through, you know, washout areas and all that sort of thing, how often are they going out? So we're also measured on frequency. So there's um incentives tied from the regulator. Uh yeah, okay. There's like a big bucket of money that we've got available if we meet those certain targets. So yep. You know, and then we can use that to build out, you know, do other things within the network and so forth. So it's heavily, heavily regulated. And the reason why it is, and I battle with this, when we think about grids and electricity and all that sort of stuff and capitalism and versus socialism and all that, I, I still battle to this day whether an, a privatized system would be beneficial for a grid because there is so much excess and so much fat. Like we have in Queensland alone, We've got over 64,000 kilometers worth of what we call SWIR network, which is single wire earth return. So in that scenario, there's only one wire that goes out to the middle of nowhere. And these customers are cattle stations, Telstra yeah, huts, yeah. out in the middle of freaking nowhere. And what we actually use to minimize costs, this is actually quite clever and quite mind-blowing if you're not aware of it, is this premise of single wire earth return. We actually use the mass of the earth as a return conductor. 
So we send the power out on one wire on little sticks and it just sits on one, one, you know, one wire on one pole yeah. all the way out. And we use the mass of the earth as a return path for the current to, to fix that circuit. If you understand wow. how circuits work, it's actually pretty trippy. Um, and that 64,000 kilometers worth of SWIR network in our network serves 4% of our customer base. Mm -hmm. They are not, we are never making money off that. Those well, that's the point, right? So that's what I was going to get to. So it doesn't make sense, therefore, to have like, this is where maybe a, a solar local generation thing might make sense, right? A battery storage, solar production, you're not maintaining the poles and wires, you, the customer's probably not getting knocked out all the time and it's not costing you fortune and you're still making some money. Does that, that to me may, totally. mix, comes into a... So not only equation, right? not only is that a, a great idea, I would argue that's that's actually going to lead it's going to lead to necessity in in the end because okay. what we're going to have to and this comes back to um, Brandon Quidham's Pioneer Species article. I don't know if you guys have read that, but no. that's a phenomenal article. And he's got a great talk with Peter McCormack about this very thing. Um, great great thinker. He he talks about this premise about Bitcoin as being a, a pioneer species. Um, and this ties into, again, this notion, I mean, and this is batshit crazy in my mind, absolutely batshit crazy. I still can't square the circle on this idea around electrifying everything. So you've got these farmers out in the middle of nowhere on the end of these SWIR networks. They're, they're, they're actually constrained with how much power. We can't supply them the power that they often want but due to those limitations of the cost to serve that customer out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so quite often, you know, with technology, they want to run three-phase welders because they're out in the middle of nowhere. We can't give them a three-phase supply. You can't mm -hmm. have a big-ass welder there. Um, there's there's other ways we, we sort of go about that. But as we sort of go to this batshit crazy notion of electrification of everything, where we're going to have no diesel motors at all, mm -hmm. what the fuck is that farmer <laughs> 1,000 Ks away from the closest town going to do in terms of range, tractors, you know, electric tractors for their farm, electric yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. dozers, yeah. graders. Like a lot of these guys have got their own machine. We want to build a charging station for one guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, exactly right. So when we get, we just simply do not have the capacity in order to supply enough of that demand for those type of technologies. So what is that going to look like? Are we going to heavily subsidize? those customers out in the middle of nowhere and this is kind of where this pioneer species it's it's an interesting thought process to go by so if you have access to um and the whole premise behind this pioneer species is is we're going to completely flip the whole uh social structure around us where humans live so humans typically congregate around uh in the past where we had access to waterways and energy sources yeah so city, that's yeah. why we've got such a big thing around cities, right? Because they're normally on large ports. They're normally, you know, for shipping and so forth. That's where we built these large cities where Bitcoin mining really introduces the ability to be able to harness energy sources in remote locations, be able to make that profitable. And then really it's this question around, does that then flip how we look at real estate? Like, and how we, Sure. congregate as humans over a long term like a short term it's not obviously going to happen but over a longer term if you're able to tap into some of these really vast energy sources and monetize it directly without having to transmit it somewhere then you can all of a sudden start to build out the infrastructure for communities so we're mm. seeing this now in 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 africa where they're putting in bitcoin mining rigs in these town like uh, close to these villages and they say let us park this here let us put some infrastructure in to tap into that hydro that naturally running creek yeah and we'll come into a revenue sharing type of arrangement where we'll build your grid out for you and we'll connect you up and it's fucking doing wonders for these communities and these villages out in the middle of nowhere yeah like human flourishing is directly correl correlated to humans ability to access energy um and oh, tying yeah, it back to these regional centers is if you do have a large um, you know, like outback Australia, tons of solar, tons of solar energy. Um, you know, a lot of these places get a lot of rain as well. So you can look at like pumped hydro schemes, you can look at wind, you can look at these combinations of things, um, hydrogen. Um, but you can start to build out the infrastructure in order to be able to address some of these problems with this uh, ongoing electrification. Now, you may disagree or agree with it, but I'm telling you, that's the way they're going. 
So there's just yet another way of uh, another wave of opportunity for Bitcoin mining to come into play to start to build out a bit more resiliency even within these remote centers. Now, just tying it back to the real estate argument is then if there's if you've got access to energy in some of these remote locations and you can go and you can get land for you know cents on the acre <laughs> kind of thing in some of these locations, does it then make sense for you if one of the overarching themes for you as a per, as a person navigating this world is to put a roof roof over your head are you really going to be you know pouring beers in the middle of sydney and paying million dollar property valuations or traveling three hours a freaking day just to get to and from work or are you going to go then perhaps look at some of these regional centers where we're starting to build out infrastructure we're starting to build out more of a social framework around regional centers hmm. so Putting your entrepreneurial head on, um, twenty-one-year-old Daz, right? Where would where would you send them? Like, what's the what? What are you? What are you looking at? Going, fuck me, that's a great opportunity. I would do that if I didn't have the the you know you you got commitments in your life. You got a new dog, right? <laughs> so um, <laughs> you got you got a toilet train a dog, right? Yeah. But let's say a a young person that's listening to this that going, oh holy shit, that guy's right. But what what are the what, what do you see as the opportunity, opportunities? Super good question. Sometimes you know it, within Bitcoin, it's so exciting because there's so many. I'm like yeah, a kid in a candy mean. store. I'm like, yeah, holy I'm fuck. gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna yeah, Ex- exactly. And sometimes it's just it's like so important to bring it back into the fold and stay in my lane. Like, yeah. you know, and what what am I working on now? Because I can honestly, I, you talk to me. I just flip on this on a daily basis. Like last week. I'm going in the middle of fucking nowhere. I'm starting my own solar farm, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna put Bitcoin miners on there. I'm gonna monetize it, and I'm gonna do all these great things. And you know, like I'm gonna create a desalination plant in the middle of fucking nowhere, <laughs> and it's gonna be powered by you know. And that's for the sort of thing that this is enabling. So it's yeah. it's super hard. It's super hard, man. And I wouldn't. Twenty uh, one year old Daz was too fucking stupid to listen. So twenty one year old Daz would have just kept going, drinking piss every weekend, and you know. <laughs> Um, so 20, 21 year old, that's a waste of time talking to him. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really haven't answered your question. So what, what really needs to happen in this country in particular is us plebs need to get vocal with your local MPs. I've said this a couple of times on a various couple of pods, various different frameworks. We need to start getting in the ears of our MPs around how important this technology really is for everybody. Like particularly now that we're looking at, we are seriously going down this route of 100% renewables. We are definitely going to subsidize that in one way, shape, or form, whether it be over-indebtedness, taxation, uh, uh, which leads to our, you know, them having to keep printing money to in- inflate that away, and our kids are going to bear the brunt of all this freaking irresponsibility. We need to get vocal. We need to say this is a way for us to offset the cost of these fucking crazy plants that you are that you are going to so you know i often say it's only going to take like i think i said recently 30 but it's not even 30 people like if you if you're an mp and you had 10 people in your constituency reach out to say this is something you need to look at that's enough yeah Yeah. you know and we're all starting meetups we're all starting to get more active we're all starting to build out our own community through the bush bashes which i'll plug in a sec and um, you know, the, these conferences and pods like you guys are running and so forth. Like the Aussies are really starting to come into our own and build it. You know, it's, it's, you know, I can't, I can't stress enough. Just people start to get vocal. I mean, you don't need to be, you know, a lot of MPs won't take your inquiry seriously if you're anonymous. So they do. Yeah. That. So that's a big issue. Like doxing yourself, whether you want people to know you've got, and I get it and I get it, but still, Spin up an anonymous account and just send them an email. You know, say, I like to remain anonymous. I am a constituent of your thing. Maybe they take it seriously. Maybe they don't. Maybe if they get 20 of those anonymous people, they they start to to pay attention and say, hmm, is this spam or is this actually a thing? And that's all we're trying to get is like, is there something in it? You know, is there is there something I can be doing for my constituents to put this in front of mine as a way of minimizing the cost that is invariably going to fall on, upon us all. Yeah. It's, and, and, and also let's just, 
I imagine that we go have a big blow off top in the next twenty four months. You're going to get some really, really well uh, funded Bitcoiners out there who, you know, they'll be idealistic on something, mm. right? Yeah. And they're going to go after their project. It's going to be very interesting and, and fun to watch them chase their project. Mm. Whether they whether they outperform Bitcoin is a whole other thing, but they're going to they're going to want to. Um, exactly. Um, so it's going to be fun to see what happens. Well, they're going to be free to do it as well. That's the point. Yeah, that's it. All yeah, of us. Yeah. Well, that's that's this is exactly it. When you become free, financially free, to do what it is that you care about, mm. you're going to work ten times harder than you ever worked in your fiat job. Yeah. Because you care about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. And uh, like, basically, everybody, not everybody, but most ninety percent of Bitcoiners right now are doing whatever it is that they're doing. Because they love it and they care about it, right? They're not making. Most people are not making any money in Bitcoin. I'm, I'll tell you, yeah, I'm making zero out of Bitcoin. Yeah, same. Like, you know, and that's all I do. Every sort of spare minute, I just love it. Like, uh, and Zelda, ultimately, mate. <laughs> except Zelda. Except when fucking Zelda comes around, I still, I have, I have still have forgiven you for that. To be honest, because it's just, oh bullshit, you love it, you love, love it more. I do, I do love it. <laughs> so good. Wish we could, wish we could play together. <laughs> plug, plug the bush bash. Bush Bash, 29th to 30th of July, up in sunny Cairns, Palm Cove. Palm Cove Surf Club, 29th to 30th. Please, Bitcoiners, come along. Um, really pumped to have this in my hometown. I don't know how I swim. Not just it. Bitcoiners, anybody who's thinking that they might be interested, right? For sure. Um, just learn. Th- come and learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and more than anything, like I think, you know, this gets said a lot, but the the bush bashes are really more around the community and the conversations you have outside of the daily um the the the, the daily presentations. Like that's yes. really where you you know, you, you have some fascinating conversations. Like so many people come from so many different walks of life, mm. but you have a real common ground. Like we most of us see the same the world in the same way around fix the money, fix the world. And the, you know, the the conversations you have around that are, are pretty mind blowing, and like I've said this a couple of times now, the optionality, like just to tie that back to what you were just saying before, um, guys, around um, like Bitcoiners in the next cycle, next blow off top, like the optionality that Bitcoin affords normal people, like for me, right, I'm still a fiat slave mind. I, I go there every single day. Yeah, I enjoy my job, but that I would enjoy allocating my time to something else better than that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I, I will never retire. I know I'll never retire, but I'll always, I'll always be hustling, but I'll just be able to work on whatever it is that's resonating with me at the time. Like right now, I would like nothing more than to start building off-grid systems for plebs, getting it ready to go for their citadels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what... You know, I'm going to do a presentation on that at Bush Bash. So if that resonates with you, come along and listen to that. So I'm going to I'm going to do a bit of a presentation around what an off grid system looks like, like rough idea and costings at the moment, and then using Bitcoin again. Like if you're looking at this whole concept and ties back to an early point for you, hats around like is it better to have uh you know condensed load around loads um generation around load centers? You mm. can do that at home. You can yeah. ultimately do that at home. And if you're going to go and buy a property and, you know, you can buy your 40 acres, put your 40 head of cattle on there and live out your days as, as your Bitcoin pleb, you can build a system out for, uh, it, it, it. it's still a little bit cost prohibitive. It's still tens of thousands of dollars, like upwards of say $60,000 to get you a really qu- quite a clean system. Mm-hmm. And that would be solar batteries and a backup diesel generator. Yep. And then what you do is you build that out with a little bit of fat. You build that out with a little bit of excess so that your batteries are charged early in the morning. And then your load then gets taken care of by the solar. Uh, and then in a normal situation where you your solar would curtail, it'll just stop generating because it's got nowhere to put it to. And that's where your Bitcoin miner would kick in. Mm-hmm. So for a little bit more optionality, you have one, one or two S19. So it's a rounding error, really, at the at today's ASIC prices. Mm-hmm. Um, compared to that whole system, it's going to cost you sixty mm-hmm. grand in total. You know, another six grand, but then you can basically be soaking up that excess solar um, through the day, and then at night time, you can also have that kick back in as well later on. If you say hit, you know, midnight, and you're normally down to a, sort of seventy percent of your battery capacity, but this particular night you're only at eighty, then you go, oh my. 
bring my miner in, you know, and you're just always utilizing the, the, the capitalization. And that's so scalable. It's scalable at that level. It's scalable at distribution level. It's scalable at grid level. And this is where I think once the regulators, once energy producers really start to understand this, it's going to fucking, that hash price is going to go through the fucking roof. Yeah. Uh, the, not the hash price, rather the the hash rate, hash rate. is going to go yeah. straight through the roof because yep. every man and his dog is going to want to be able to. We've never had the ability to directly tie a monetary good to energy before. Yeah. Well, the it's reason solar is so big in Australia is the orig- the original feed in tariffs were high. Incentivize right. people to incentivize people to do it, and they will. And and this is um. That actually had such a catastrophic effect on the baseline energy price. Like mm-hmm. I experienced that. I was working in an asset management team at the time when they put that 44 cent for Queensland it was 44. I understand like Victoria was up to 66 cents per kilowatt hour export back to the grid. Now all that did, and this is <laughs> this is where government policy doesn't always, doesn't ever, hardly ever have the wage earning pleb in mind, right? So the people who took advantage of that were people with big ass bank accounts. Yes. Right? Could go at the time, put $17,000 worth of solar on their roof, put it on their sheds, spin up another, spin up another, um, are you, is that, was that, I, see, was that you? See? I, big. I, did, I did it. 60 Look. cents. Uh, yeah. My bad. But no, no, no. Look, man. That please don't under. I've taken advantage of this shit too. If it's there under a government thing and you're a pleb and you're a wage earner, absolutely take fucking advantage of all that. You'd be fucking stupid not to. This is pre Bitcoin, pre Bitcoin. Look, even post Bitcoin, mate. Like, would have anyway. If, I know. If I it exists, anyway. if it exists and you can stack more, absolutely yeah. lean into yeah, it yeah. because I guarantee other people are. But the point I was trying to make is that the rich people were able to put those systems on and basically erode their electricity bill. Mm. which arguably they were the only ones who could afford it. But the stresses that that put on the network and the mm. downstream effects of that were, that were unseen until years later were absolutely astronomical. So mm. just as a really small example, when you've got two neighbors that share a transformer and then this guy, our, our, and our, um, our standards were if we hit a voltage rate of 256 nominal volts, so 240 was our nominal voltage in Australia back then. Um, if you hit 256, your solar inverter was supposed to switch off. Now that was in 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 grid systems. There's a whole host of reasons why your voltage will fluctuate around 240, um, particularly on long low loaded lines that can actually creep up quite high. So what you would end up having is that is your solar would reach this 256 limit and cut it off. So then you'd call your contractor up and you'd say, hey, I'm not exporting. I'm getting a bill now. Can't come back and fix it. And we'd have all these contractors who would dial into the back of these inverters and just switch that feature off. Wow. So as you're pushing back at 256, your neighbor got solar then and he's trying to push back at 256 and you're fighting each other and then he's tripping off. And then what that ended up happening was all your appliances that start popping because we got voltages that are too high. There's no uh, limit now. We get 260, and we've got all these voltage investigations running around. We got bungees running around, hanging recorders up, saying, "What's going on with your voltages? Why are we getting all these voltage complaints?" Because people were exporting back onto the grid onto a system that wasn't prepared for it. Yeah, they didn't understand the impacts that that large, like swath of solar would have on the system and that's only just one example but it was that example alone was worth millions and millions and millions of dollars and what it actually resulted in is us having to change the whole australian standard to reduce your um your socket voltage from 240 volts to 230 volts wow and the amount of work that that change alone created was again millions and millions and millions worth of dollars because we had to run around and make sure that every single transformer on the network was then within new bands around the 230 standard. So that 256 dropped to about, uh, well, it didn't drop much, but 254, and then the lower limit changed as well. But they basically had to make sure that every single um, transformer on the network, and they're just the, these little transformers on all the poles, on every street corner, were within bands to make sure that those voltages were achieved. And this just goes to 
like the unintended consequence, the, the intention, the original intention may be good. Yeah. Let's yeah. give the benefit of the doubt. The original intention it could be good, but the unintended consequences having the second, well, third, fourth order effects. And it just highlights it highlights the problem with government intervention in markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, always. The downstream effects probably arguably couldn't have even been foreseen, right? But at the end of the day, you're fucking with natural markets. And it and it, oh, normal normally always results in bad outcomes. Mm. Why should people not go to the bush bash? Why there, is one, there is one reason why they probably should maybe think twice. To which one? The Cairns one? Because yeah. uh, Hudson Bruno aren't going to be there. No, no, I was more thinking about the the, the, the evening entertainment. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. I was going, oh, oh, you cut me real deep. <laughs> but you had to put up with it for a whole weekend, so I guess you... you oh, um, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely joking. Right. Tell them that's you're what at I'm and what and it's not Rog nine thousand actually, so Ooh. you're you're even doubly in for a um a, a double whammy uh, of disappointment. So on the Saturday night, I'll, uh, yeah, I was planning on. I saw upstairs at the surf club. They're gonna um, open up the bar for us plebs and stock it up there. So it's not normally where they they serve drinks, but um, yeah. I was gonna put a PA together just so that if we do have a big house that you can be heard. And then I thought, oh, why not just plug the guitar and we'll sing some. Sing some old bangers, old yeah, pub bangers. People will go to to kickstart a music career. It's unbelievable. <laughs> music, like changing his I, whole career, becoming a Bitcoiner, just all just for this. Yeah, exactly. I want. I wanted to. Um, I wanted to print out a QR code. To, you know, bungee stream me some sats, but I haven't had time. So keep your sats, oh, boy, people. Oh, do that, free. man! You got to do that. The music's free. Fuck yeah! yeah the boy can sing and he can play. So go go listen to Daz. Um, when is it again? Remind us. 29th and 30th of July. So what's that? Two weeks, two weeks time, two, two weekends time. How's, how's, uh, sorry, before we go, how's Mitchie going? I miss Mitchie too. He's good. He's, he started a new role himself, actually. Uh, the old, um, public utility docks, but, oh, um, no, oh, he's, hmm. he's, he's good lad. He's coming. He's coming. His brother's coming to the bush bash. Oh, nice. Awesome. What I did not realize until very recently, I don't know how I know this now, is that Mitch got order, orange pilled you. I thought it was the other way around. Uh, no, no, yeah, no. so he um he yeah. he claims that the 2017 he was trying to I don't really remember this because I remember a lot of shit cornery going on with these boys, but no, I, I'll okay. give him the benefit of the doubt. 2017 <laughs> he was trying to get me to buy uh buy Bitcoin, buy other things, uh, and okay. uh, I thought it, I just wrote it off totally as a scam. I thought you know I was too smart for that back then. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, hey, Mitch. Hey, Mitch, have a great love you. have love a you. great love you. Well, Mitch. I hope it goes really great up at the yeah. bush. I'm sure it will. We're jealous. Yeah. Um, mate, plug the book, plug the whatever you want. All right, cool. Yeah, I might give the uh, book a plug. So we released Beers for Bitcoin. Um, really, really chuffed with the overwhelming support, most of the, mostly from the Aussies um, backing us in there um, and, and the Canadians as well. Um, so Beers for Bitcoin is was a book that we wrote. Uh, it's going to be a Sorry, course. can I just, so we will. B is for Bitcoin. It sounds a lot like Beers for Bitcoin. That's what, that's what it sounds like. Sounds. Beers for Bitcoin. Fucking Queensland. Aussie, Aussie draw. Fucking Queensland. <laughs> uh, yes, B, the letter B, that is B, is for Bitcoin. Um, so that book will be released as a course. So the idea is we wrote that as a course. Mm -hmm. And then we thought um, just as a way to try and um, make Looking Glass a viable concern moving forward, we thought, hey, this is a really actually quite a handy little book. We'll self-publish it. So we self-published through Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole premise was that we we released a course back in when we launched. I can't even remember when that was, April last year. Was it last year, year before? Wow. Um, last year. Okay. I Sorry, time, time flies. I don't know. Like it's just Time does fly. I lose, I lose track of years. I'm not real good at date recall. But um, so we released that foundations course and that was around the why Bitcoin, why you would p consider Bitcoin um, as a gentle orange pilling for, you know, basically for plebs to send their friends and family as to why you're crazy enough to to own this 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 asset. Um, and then we thought, well, to accompany that, we need another course then as to the what is Bitcoin. So if you're going to consider it, you really need to know in order for you not to get shaken out when you have heaps of volatility, you start to, you need to start that learning process around like trying to understand what the hell this thing is. And so we, we set out um, to, to, to make that. And basically what we did is we, we've created as a book 
if you can spare the stats, we'd love the support to for you to jump on Amazon, search that out. It's available in most marketplaces around the world as an ebook and also um, as a printed um, soft print version. Um, but if you can't afford the SATs, it will be available for free as a course in due course. So at the moment, I'm just working on some of the recordings for that, getting it uploaded to the site. So within the next two or three months, it'll be available to to everybody to to do if you if you can't afford the SATs. And for, just, for all those virtue signalers and the podcasters that need to have a book on their shelf to behind them to make it look like they've read a lot. I've actually jump, there's jump down subtle, oh, have you, is, you've you've blurred that out. I can't see. Is it there? The subtle product <laughs> placement. It's there. blurred. Your background's blurred. You didn't. It's all good. And just yeah. an uh, industry insider term. Uh, when you said the soft version, it's actually called a paperback. <laughs> the paperback. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> now, um, hey, Brenda. So did um some. Some, you said some woman that looks a lot like hats come and hide the books. Yeah, did you say that? Some woman that looks did like me. That? She's a hairy bitch. No, he goes, oh, sorry, it, sorry. It's gone out, and I said, yeah, like a, a forty-year-old, forty-something-year-old woman. Um, oh no, he said, was it hats? And I said, forty-something-year-old woman. Yes, it was hats. Anyway, <laughs> no, it was, no to be honest, it was actually um, it went on to a six-year-old's uh, library card. <laughs> Young girl, but I'm I'm guessing it was I actually the terrible, mother though. that used that card. Yeah, wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah. but online, man. I, I was I was looking for yours to put it out, and I'm like, oh well, there's Jeff. I'll put Jeff out. I was thinking of would I get in trouble for this, or would you if I could come into the library and just put like a like a I don't know what, some, wank in the library? No. Yeah, yes, you would get in trouble again. Um, yeah, <laughs> and some uh, somehow put some sats in a, a claim for some sats inside the books. Oh, like, could, like, you know, like light QR. sats or something. You remember Joe was talking about light sats. Maybe I could scan a QR. They could claim the sats just for reading them, just as a prize. Would that could? Would you get in trouble for that? No, I'll, well, I'm I, doing I, that. I can't you stop you doing anything. That's well, cool. That's, that's like, you you would not believe the shit we found in the middle of a book. Well, tell us more about that. <laughs> no, we need we need. No, nah, we'll do now. that. Go we'll on. do it off the pod. We got to sign off on this. All right. Okay. I will tell you though. Tell, give them one. Give them one good one. Give the people. Give the listeners something to. Right, condom, actual shit. Oh, three thousand dollars in cash. Oh, well, there you go. Three thousand dollars in cash. I yeah. was. I will not be leaving an empty three thousand dollars worth of sat. <laughs> what was this in the same book? What a party! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a yeah, good weekend. Right. <laughs> Eighty-one. A condom, actual shit, and three grand. Woo-hoo. All right, we better sign off since this is an actual. That's the pod. clip. That's the clip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Daz, my man. Always Love a you. pleasure, Daz. Love you, boys. Love you. Likewise, All right. I, I'm I'm starting to warm to this love as well. You wish. <laughs>